I think more than we realize sometimes, we live more in a land that looks like Babylon than it looks like the promised land. Culture around, around us seems to move in, in a direction that uh, makes it countercultural to live faithfully to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're in a place sometimes that seems unfamiliar and at times even unfavorable to us. And again, we have different interpretations of what that means or what's to blame for that, but the reality is this world is not our home and it, sometimes it seems like we're in a strange and a foreign land. You know, what's interesting to me, and, and you could find you know, leading Christian figures who could vouch for any of these, I think there are three common ways that we try to respond when we live in Babylon. The first is of a holy huddle. And the holy huddle is... When we say, let's just uh, put our head down and let's get through it because eventually this season will pass. And so let's gather together, let's remain tight, let's jump into the foxhole, let's just survive this because eventually the storm will be over. The second option is that we can engage in the holy war and the holy war means that if, if God is really who he says he is and if God is good and if God is true, then we should w work to the fact that everything that does not align with the principles of God inside of society, we should rail against and fight against and attempt to change because the kingdom of God should look like or should be made manifest in the kingdom of the earth. And when it's not, we're going to fight every battle and we're going to raise a stink with every situation to try to make here look like what heaven should look like. The holy war. The third option sometimes is what we'll call the holy compromise, and that is we're going to acquiesce and when in Babylon, let's live like the Babylonians. And so scripture may say this, but we're, you know, we can, while we're here in Babylon, at least just for 70 years, let's just go along with it. After all, we know a silly gold statue is just a statue, like, you know, I have a good job, I have an opportunity to, to be involved, to be engaged in what I'm doing, so who cares if we just bow down? Do you know I think there's truth in every one of these? Maybe not so much the compromise, but I, I even think sometimes the intentions are good there. And again, you, you could find leading Christian figures that in some ways seem to almost speak inside of these language, either foxhole imagery, or you know, we're gonna try to you know, fight every ba battle and to kind of make America the Christian nation that it, it should be, or that we're going to just, well, you know, let's, let's just adjust to what science and culture tell us should be the case, and God will sort it all out later. I think there's an alternative to these three, and I think the alternative maybe even includes some aspect of this, and, and that is, what's it look like to live faithfully here and now that I can have an impact where I am, and I can remain strong and devoted where I am, and it's not necessarily selling out to any one of these three approaches, but it says, God, how would you have me prioritize faith right in the middle of Babylon? And there's going to be some places where I'm going to put a stake in the ground and says, even if he doesn't, I will not bow. And there's going to be some places where, you know, that I can engage and have an impact and be excellent, even inside of a pagan empire. And there's going to be some things that even when I don't understand, I can remain fixed on the one who holds my future. And it's kind of messy to be in that place because it's, it's a whole lot easier just to do one of these three. But I think we miss something when we completely jump into one of these pockets and maybe miss what God has for us in the middle of Babylon? What would it look like to be committed, to be faithful, focused and fixed, and even to have an influence inside of the world in which we live? All right, so now we're to the point I have 10 statements I want to share with you all. Uh, again, some of these are going to be simple and most obvious. Uh, some you may want to have further conversation about. Um, all right, here we go. Number one, your primary identity is to be a child of God and a citizen of his kingdom. That's basic Bible 101. C.S. Lewis says, said that what, what you think about God is the most important thing about you. And when you can consider the scope of eternity... Your life here on earth is but this, and eternity is this. The primary thing that is true about your life is not where you live or where you work or your political affiliation or what your feelings on any topic. The primary thing about your identity is that you are a child of God to be 
that you were created by him and to be known by him and to spend an eternity with him. And that shapes everything about who we are. No surprise there. Point number two, you live here and now. You live in the 21st century, in the Northeast, in America. You live here and now, and we are called to engage and improve upon where we live. We cannot go back and place you inside of 1954 or inside of 1820 or whatever place that you would say that it would be easier to be faithful there. It'd be easier to be a Christian there. You live here at this period of time, in this set of circumstances, inside of this culture, inside of the climate where we are, you have the opportunity and the privilege to live as a faithful follower of Jesus Christ in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of an election year, in the middle of where you live. And God has placed you there. Number three, you should care deeply about matters local, regional, national, and international. This is not a matter of because our citizenship is in heaven, that then that means that whatever happens here, happens here, it doesn't matter, eventually I'm not going to live here anymore, God's going to take me, it's going to be fine. No, because you've been placed here to make a difference, you should care deeply about the issues that take place. Now, what that means also is that based on your personality and your experience and your background, there are, gonna, there are some things that are hardwired into you that raise your heartbeat that don't necessarily raise my heartbeat. There are things that you, you see a commercial or you hear an opportunity and immediately it tugs at your heart where somebody else just says, oh, okay, that's nice. It's not because you are holy and they are heartless. It's because that there are things that are driven deep down within us, that there are certain things that, that grab a hold of us, and that's good, and that is God-given most of the time. And that you should care deeply for the things that God has placed on your heart to care about, to, to desire to make a difference. But I think it also causes us to realize a couple of things, that one, the things I want to stand for are often determined by where I sit. And so how I see the world and, and the things that have shaped me determine then the things that really get my attention, that raise my blood pressure in a positive way or in a negative way. And that's important and that's true about me and I need to own that, but also I need to realize that maybe not everybody shares all of the same convictions about all the same things with all the same stances in the same way that I do, and it's okay, they can still be my brother or sister in Christ. So you should care deeply, and that should be an incredibly personal thing for you. Number four. You should pray regularly and fervently for government leaders and for national issues. What's interesting, and, th and this has been kind of not necessarily statistically proven, proven, but people have borne witness to the fact that our natural tendency is when anxiety rises about things taking place, whether in my personal life or in my country or in the world, when anxiety rises, prayer does not automatically rise. Sometimes in some of our lives, it even goes the opposite, that when anxiety rises, my prayer life goes down. Because I don't know what to say to God, or I'm mad at God, or I don't know how to pray, or I don't know what to say, or I'm just so confused by it all, that what's interesting is the one thing that we've been called to do to make a difference, the primary thing at least we've been called to do to make a difference, we are tempted sometimes to neglect. So I want to say that not only should you pray regularly for your leaders, but as your anxiety about things go up, proportionately your prayer focus and your prayer life should increase by that same amount. Because prayer changes things. In our world, in us, or both. We should pray. Five, you should vote. Just like you, you should pray, you should also vote. You should care deeply about the issues and the persons involved. This is not something where, again, we just lean so into our heavenly citizenship that we neglect the earthly opportunities and the earthly responsibilities that we have. Number six, and this is one I've been thinking about, is we should be slow to interpret Local and contemporary events, meaning thing, things that are happening in my life and things that are happening in my time, we should be, be slow to interpret local and contemporary events with cosmic, cosmic and eternal meaning. What's that mean? That means is this. You hear in every natural disaster, you hear in every disease, in every election, that you know, God must be judging us, God must be upset, there must be a major thing. This is a turning point in human history, and, 
and you hear that, and, and I'm not saying to minimize the importance of the issues that we face, but think about in the scope of human history, how many elections that there have been. Think in, in the scope of human history, how many diseases and pandemics there have been. Think about in the scope of human history that the things that we want to pound, you know, the, the alarm and, and hit the panic button and say, this is the most important thing that has ever happened, displays in a sense a little bit of our arrogance as 21st century Americans to think that all of human history hinges on what we do here and now. Do you know what's taking place inside of like our nation in this you know, period of time might not even be the biggest thing taking place in the world right now. Because while we struggle through a pandemic and an economic crisis and, a, and an election and all sorts of just different things going on around us, there is also someone, you know, in Africa today who gets up and also struggles amidst the pandemic, but walks two miles to get water from a muddy, dirty water in the hopes that her child doesn't die tomorrow. And we tend to think that heaven rises and falls based on what happens in our little corner of the world, in our little corner of human history. Now again, does it matter? Absolutely. Should we care? Absolutely. Should we engage? Absolutely. But we need to be sometimes slow to interpret the things that are taking place with this cosmic reality as though this were it. Do you know that every generation of the church, since the time of Jesus, thought they were living in the last days? And I think that that's good and I think that that's helpful because I think it creates in us an urgency and a fervency to prioritize God inside of our life in the here and now, to know him and to make him known. And I think that's good and that, that's productive, but do you know what? It continues. And the problems of the third century led into the fourth century and led into the fifth century and the seventh and the ninth and the 15th and the 18th and the 19th and the 20th. And eventually one of us will be correct that this is the last generation, and maybe it's ours and maybe it's not. The old preacher joke is we're closer to the end of the world now than we've ever been, just because of how history winds down. But I think there's a danger sometimes when we, we so want to draw meaning and application. And so we make statements and we say, God must be judging, God must be unhappy, God must be about to do something because after all, you know, how is it that two hurricanes converge and there's a pandemic and there's a this and there's a that and the reality is we just don't know the grand scheme of what God is doing. And sometimes it takes us into application and to conclusions that we should not draw based off things we do not know. Do you know, I think the good thing of every generation since the time of Jesus, thinking they were in the last days, made them acutely aware of the fact that God is the author of human history, and we need him now more than ever. And it's important that people get right with God and that people help other people get right with God. And it's important that we not lose focus on the things that are most important inside of our lives. We don't go back and read the writings of the fourth century about how a writer concluded about the, the king inside of his era was, you know, the sign of the end and the end time. Eventually that stuff fades away, but we stand on the shoulders of people who have been faithful to keep primary things primary. All right, getting bogged down. Number seven, convictions should always bring us into tension with our environment and culture. Jesus said that this world is, you know, my kingdom is not of this world. This world is not our home. And so there will always be a gap between the priorities of the Christian and between the reality of the world in which we live. And even in the most Christian of societies down through history, and there have been points in time where the veil has gotten thinner between the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God, but there's always been a gap because there's a reality that we've not yet real reached and realized and live into that still remains. There is a not yet to our faith. There is certainly a now to our faith, but there is also a not yet that is not fully realized. And so that tension that's there is good. And I hope and pray that there's always a tension in me that says, this is not the way it should be. This is not the way it could be. There is still more work to be done. There are still ways in which our society could better reflect the kingdom of God because that gap reminds me that there's still more to come and that God's still at work. Number eight, pay attention to the source and the amount of your inputs. The source and the amount of your inputs. 
we think about this in terms of, of diet all the time that, you know, a health coach once told me that you cannot exercise enough just to be able to eat whatever you want to eat. But the key is, if you want to lose weight, the key is on the input side of things of what's going in. I've mastered that lesson and I've learned it very well, but the, the reality is, like, there's also been studies done that there is the proportion of time that we spend watching and reading and saturating ourselves in the news does not lead to greater peace and optimism, but it, it increases things like anxiety and depression and frustration and anger. And I'm not here to tell you how much you should watch the news or how much you should read or what station you should watch or what station you should never watch. You have opinions there and that's fine and that's good. But I simply wanna say just pay attention to the source or the sources and the amount. And what's it producing in me? Because you know and I know that the news and marketing and, and most everything that comes at us is usually meant to increase not hope, but fear. Fear to tell you what the problem is and who's to blame for it. And we need to just pay attention. I'm not saying watch less news. I'm saying pay attention at least to the source and to the amount of the things that are going in. And is it drawing me more into godliness or more into who's to blame and, and how to fix it? And, and it decreases our faith and our hope about what God's doing inside of our world. The goal is not to bury your head in the sand or ignore the issues that are there, but to simply engage responsibly where God has us. You know, there's a term that they've kind of invented called doom scrolling. And doom scrolling is the more time you do this on your phone, because usually it comes in moments where we're tired or we're frustrated. The more time you do this, it almost increases this thing within us that says the world is negative. The world is bad. The world is worse today than it was last year. And there are these biases that take place. The one is we look back to the past and say that that was good, that was great, that was when everything was good. And the more I look and I read and I think, the more I think the world's just going downhill and downhill. And you know what? The, there are some significant problems and maybe the world is going downhill, but I know that the more time I spent looking and reading and thinking about it, it threatens my hope and it threatens my engagement, and sometimes it even threatens my faith. So just pay attention to the sources and the amount of your inputs. All right, number nine, we're almost done. This one is simple, have real conversations. Since March, your desire to, or your ability to sit across from another living, breathing human person that's not in your family has been diminished. And so what do we do? We have our conversations here. And when you have your conversations here, you can argue with the one or two points that you most disagree with the person, fictional or real, on the other side of the screen. And so I can respond here, you know, because of this one thing that this one person said, I can pull apart everything about them and everything about their ideology. Do you know that if I sit across from the other person, we may talk for an hour and I might still conclude that they're an idiot and they're at the lunch and they don't know what they're talking about, but I at least have to acknowledge the fact I see why they believe that. I don't understand how they could come to that conclusion, but I see how they got to where they are. I understand their point. I also see the fact that the person that's talking to me is living and breathing and at least desires inside of their, their own way at least to love God or make the best even of the environment that we're in or whatever the course of the conversation. The problem is when this is threatened and we get to live here combined with doom scrolling, then we also engage in these conversations that are artificial and it doesn't help us. It's easier now to do this than it was a couple of months ago, but I, still, I think we've gotten into habits and patterns maybe where this is still hard to get after. What's even harder is when we do have these conversations, it's probably with the people who believe exactly the same way we do. So even those conversations aren't necessarily productive and, and fruitful and like iron sharpening iron, instead it's more of a 
well, at best, a, a pep rally of the people who have it all figured out, or a, at worst, a gripe session of all the things that are wrong inside of the world. I need more real conversations inside of my life. And not even necessarily to change my viewpoint or teach me what I don't know, but even just to associate with a person on the other side of the table and to talk through things beyond just my understanding of where I am. Finally, number 10. We must be willing to put our faith filter before or ahead of our political filter. This goes right back to point number one, that your primary citizenship is as a child of God. And we know this to be the case, and none of us would, if it does happen, admit to the fact that we've placed our political filter first and our spiritual filter or our faith filter second, but it is so easy the way it is it happens because we reduce things that our ideology begins to dictate how we see God versus the other way around. Who you vote for should be a reflection of and come out of the things that you deeply believe in about God and about faith. The problem is when what you believe about God and about faith stems from who you've already decided to vote for. Let's make sure the things that are in first place are in first place and the things that are in second place are in second place and we at least live through that in the proper order and perspective. Do you know when the church was birthed? It stood in a very precarious place because you had the Jewish temple and the Jewish leadership at odds with the young Christian church and you also had the Roman Empire at odds with the Christian church. Do you know two millennium later the temple in Jerusalem is gone and it's been gone for 1900 years. The Roman Empire and all its strength and power is, is gone and has been gone for 1,500 years. And the church of Jesus Christ, with all its imperfections and the highs and the lows and the things we've gotten right and the things that we haven't gotten right, continues to remain true because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. And so it's interesting that, that the early church set out not to subvert the Roman Empire or not to destroy the Jewish temple, but to be faithful inside of where God had placed them to put first things first, and that was the gospel of Jesus Christ inside of a broken world could make all the difference. And history has never been the same. So, all that to say this, I follow up a 10-point sermon with four things just to leave you with. So, I don't want these, not just three months, I don't know if it's six months, I don't know if it's a year, but this season that we're in, I don't want it to define me. I don't want it to distract me from what's most important. I don't want it to divide me from the people that I need to be linked with. And I don't want it to devour me. You know it said that Satan roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he might devour? But Jesus said, I've come that they might be one just as, Father, you and I are one, that the world might know that you have sent me. Let's be sure when this thing's all over that we are not defined simply by the patterns, good or bad, that we see inside of culture. And that this season doesn't define us, distract us, divide us, or certainly devour us. Because there is so much at stake. And what's at stake is not merely just the future of a country that one day is going to cease to exist anyway. What's at stake is what God wants to do inside of his kingdom, inside of where we live in the here and now, but for the sake of all of eternity. That's where we live for. That's where we seek to be faithful. That's the perspective that we have in mind as the people of God. It's so easy to think that the problem is out there. And if out there could be fixed, if out there could look different, if out there could be changed, everything would be fine when... When you read your New Testament, it always starts with the primary problem and the primary place of change is always in here. And when in here can be changed and transformed, it has the capacity to make it an influence and make a difference and make a change in the out there, but it always begins in here. Let's pray. God, there are so many things going on inside of our world that we can't fix. We can't make go away. 
to be honest, we don't know if we've got it all figured out or if we are completely clueless. But Lord, like individuals in a pagan land, our desire is to be faithful, to place first things first, and to pray that you would meet us, even inside of the circumstances and the times that aren't so great. So God, we pray today for pandemics and elections and economics and all sorts of big things, but we also pray that on the very basic level that you would do what you need to do in us, that we might be faithful to you even in the middle of Babylon. God, we pray that you would use us to make a difference, to have a positive influence inside of the place and inside of the time where you have called us and you have placed us. God, we would invite you to continue to build your church, even in the midst of the not so good. God, we trust you to do what only you can do, and Lord, would you hold us close that we might be known first and foremost as people who are children of the King, that you are for us and not against us, and that you have promised to lead us through. We trust you with that today, and it's in the name of Jesus. We pray all these things. Amen.